stay around. And then finally begin implementation. A lot of people begin implementation without these other steps and then a couple years down the road aren't real happy with the results that they got. Some people do all of this but just can't quite pull the trigger to drill the well, to put that fence in, and move ahead. So make sure you do your homework and know what you're doing, have a good plan, know what it's going to cost you, but then make sure you go ahead and take that first step and put it in place. <coughs> We're going to talk about two basic approaches to splitting up pastures for managed grazing. The first one is what we call fixed design, and it uses permanent fence and watering points. This is our definition of a permanent fence. Some people still think that a permanent fence means five strands of barbed wire or something. To us, it's a one or two wire electrified high tensile fence on solid corners with line posts the wildlife can't knock the wire off. Now back here, um, white-tailed deer is about the only wildlife that might knock down your temporary fences and maybe tear up your uh, permanent fences. One thing that did change when we moved from Missouri to Idaho is we had to learn to live with elk, moose, antelope moving across the landscape at 57 miles an hour who can't see a wire, uh, mule deer which are bigger than the uh, uh, white tails here, and then also wolves, lions, bear, you know, who might want to come in and uh, prey on our critters. And I don't mean pray for their souls, I mean they are eating why eat their bodies. Um, so, it, for just strictly cattle in this part of the world, uh, we're basically on a you know, one wire fence. And we're subdividing, putting up permanent fence, subdividing pasture. <coughs> Most of the time I'm just thinking about one wire fence. We do a lot of two wire fences. Where we live now, the average annual precipitation is between six and eight inches. The ground does get dry. Conductivity of the soil isn't that good, so we do tend to do some two-wire fences as hot ground systems. Um, we learned a lot about from Doug Schaefer, the true test rep, earlier this year about bipolar fencing, and I don't know if Doug talked about uh, bipolar fencing, but it's a technology unique to the true test energizers. That those of you who were here yesterday, and I didn't hear Doug talk, did he talk about bipolar? No. Okay. On a bipolar system, uh, this wire, if you set up two wires, this one would carry 5,000 volts of positive polarity, this one 5,000 volts of negative polarity. If the animal touches an individual wire and it's grounded appropriately, they'll still get a shock from that. But if they touch both wires, they could be standing on glass and they'll get a 10,000 volt shock between those two wires extremely effective in desert country that we, we, that we deal with as a, uh, a fencing technology to make electric fences work where they've never worked before. So th this is our definition of a uh, permanent fence. If we're looking at sheep and goats in the operation, then we're going to put three wires on it. Three wires, you know, we used to say that when it came to fences and goats, if it'll hold water, it'll hold a goat. <laughs> Now what we say is put the appropriate true test energizer on it and it'll hold goats. Uh, I do know people who graze goats with two wires. I don't know anyone who's doing goats on a regular basis with a single wire. Anybody doing rotational grazing of goats with a single wire? All right, down in the Falkland Islands, uh, Don and I, we've been down there uh, a few times working with the uh, Department of Agriculture and the farmers of the Falkland Islands. I have seen sheep being rotationally grazed with single wire fences. All you got to do is train them. You create enough of a psychological barrier and uh, you can graze sheep with a single wire fence. I wouldn't have believed it, but I saw it. Yes? What height is that uh, wire? What height is that wire? About 10 inches. About 10 inches. That's as far as the sheep is concerned, it's a barrier that goes up to the sky level. How do you tra train sheep? You give them a bad experience when they're naked. Shear the sheep, 
force them to experience electric fence, and it'll be a lifelong memory for them. So we, and, and that's what they do there. They do their serious training. Uh, after they sheared the sheep, put them in a real tight confinement with the electric fence there. And not, they, they don't start with a single wire. You know, it'll be a three or four wire fence. Uh, they just learn that fences are things you don't touch. And they can, once they're trained, they can go down to single wires. Yes, sir? Is this one or two wire for cattle, three for sheep and goats? Is that the interior and exterior perimeter fences? Or okay. Good, good question here. Is this interior and exterior fence that I'm talking about in a state like Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Illinois, where you have fence laws? And you are required to fence your animals in onto your property. There's a definition of a legal fence that if you do not have that legal fence there and you have stock on the road, you have full liability if someone hits it, injured, killed, whatever. So, in the state of Missouri, uh, four wires is the minimum legal requirement for a fence. So, if you were doing perimeter fence in Missouri, you would want four wires minimum to semi-protect yourself on insurance. In Idaho, we're an open range state. We are a fence out state. If you do not want somebody else's livestock on your property, you are obligated to fence those livestock out. If you do not put up an effective fence, the free ranging cattle have every right to come onto your property and eat your rose bushes or whatever. Now, because we deal so much with heavy wildlife pressure, I mean, our, and our cattle would rarely cross a, very rarely ever cross a fence like that. To me, it's calling criteria if someone is crosses the two wire fence. Uh, the next spring on the ranch we're on, we're going to put up fence like that as the highway. I use the term loosely. It is a paved road goes by. It's not a highway. Um, but we're going to use that for the road fence because the, the barbed wire, there's four strand barbed wire right there and the elk just riddle it. If a, if a fence isn't electrified, the elk have zero respect you know, for it. You put up a fence like that with electricity and they don't bother us anymore. What's that? What height for 10? 30, 30 inch, the typical fence we build is 30 inch top wire, 20 inch bottom wire. The, uh, and again, to me, if you have cattle that will cross a 30 inch electric wire, you need to call them. Because if you dump and say, well, I've got to build a four wire fence that's four foot tall, or I've got to put up uh, you know, a welded wire fence or something, you are letting the animals dictate business policy of the ranch. And they are lousy business managers. Cows are very good at being cows if we allow them to be cows, but they have no sensibilities for running our business, so don't let them do that. We started, this is the, uh, the original PowerFlex post, the, uh, the composite post. They've got the G2 post now, which we've only uh, installed nine of them on our place. Back when they first became available, end of May, first of June, Chris, uh, Roy sent us uh, nine posts. We have, we have one fence in our grazing system on the pivots, a permanent fence that the pivots have to walk across. So we needed flexibility. We have to have flexibility in that fence so the pivot towers can go over it. And so we put those nine G2 posts in that fence. And the pivot this season has probably crossed over about 30 times. And, and they're doing fine. But uh, we started using the, the PowerFlex post, I guess at 85. Is David in here? David's probably out working. Don, do you remember, was it 1985? When we started, oh, excuse me. I'm living in the past, 2005. Sorry, sorry. Everybody was confused except me. I knew exactly what I was saying. Now, was it 2005? Yeah, okay, in 2005 is when we started using the PowerFlex post out there. And we went for the flexibility, the wildlife friendliness of it. Because the other, the, the, there were electric fences on the place, but they were either on steel T posts or on one inch fiber rod posts. And neither of those have any flexibility. Uh, you have 40, 50 yelp come down, you know, all the way, you know, 
weighing 600 to 1,000 pounds, and they just plow into your fences. Uh, steel posts end up having permanent, you know, 45 degree bends in them. The fiber rods are all out of the ground, twisted around. The power flex post was the ground that the post that would stay in the ground for us and flex with the, the wildlife passing over them. Uh, so that's when we started using the, uh, the original power flex post. Uh, when we build those new fences along the, the road, they'll be on the, uh, the G2 post. The other feature of fixed grazing design is we put in permanent watering points. Now something about a permanent watering point is it becomes the focal point of animal behavior. More than any other factor, even on a 20-acre pasture here in Missouri, where the stock water is located is what defines where animals spend a lot of their time. Here, shade is the other factor. Out west where we are, you know, most of our, uh, most of our summer days are in the 70s and lower 80s with 10% humidity. So we do not have, and at night, even in August, our, most of our lows are usually down in the 40s. So we have no heat stress. So shade is a non-factor where, where we live. Water becomes the focal point of where animals are traveling to and spending their time. As soon as you put a water tank in one particular location, you've basically committed to that location as being the direction the animals want to travel on a regular basis, they're going to be, over time, moving manure, moving nutrients towards that water point. We always, on uh, a landscape like this, we like to put permanent water tanks on high points in the landscape. Now, a lot of you probably have ponds with a tank below the pond, which means you always, your, uh, your water is at a low point in the landscape. Animals prefer to walk downhill as opposed to walking uphill. So they're always moving nutrients towards your water. They're moving nutrients downhill on the landscape. The other thing that happens is, particularly if we have a tank below a pond, very often it's either in the bottom of a, uh, you know, a drainage channel or just up off the side. So you get those two, three, four inch thunderstorms that you sometimes have. Essentially, you've created just a big flush system. You're already moving manure and nutrients towards the drain, towards the bottom of the drainage, and then you get a big rain, you just flush it out. And that's one way of losing a lot of nutrients out of your pasture system that you have to replace with fertilizer. So if we can pump water and put it higher on the landscape, the tr natural travel patterns of the animals is always moving nutrients uphill, higher onto the landscape, so that when we do get a rain, it might move down slope some, but hopefully not immediately go into the streams and creeks and disappear from our system. So when you do permanent water, you do create that situation. So again, to be, you need to be careful and put a lot of thought into where you put water points. The other approach is what we call a flexible design, which uses portable fence and water facilities and a framework of permanent fence. This is where we basically use the movable tank, poly wire, and just a few permanent high tensile fences to create the framework. Movable tanks. I have seen 600 gallon movable tanks. I've seen 20 gallon movable tanks. The number of head that you have and then the recharge rate, how fast you put water back into that tank, is what dictates how large the tank needs to be. We, up in North Missouri on our farm there, uh, we've run 120, 125 head of stockers all summer long on 25 gallon tanks. As long as the animals aren't traveling too far back and forth from water, and you can put water in there faster than they can drink it out, even in pretty hot, humid conditions of the Midwest, a sm very small, movable tank will work well. Uh, 25 gallons. Why, why is a small tank handy? You can send little kids out to do the work. You know, it's hard for them to move a 100, 150, 200 gallon tank, but 
a 25-gallon tank, usually they can tip it over and move it on to the next 